65 million years ago, an asteroid hit planet Earth. That asteroid caused such disruption, such a change in the global environment, that it destroyed all the slow and lumbering dinosaurs. All who survived were the furry little mammals who could adapt rapidly to that change. There's another asteroid that is striking the Earth, not in 30 years, not in 20 years, not in 10 years. It's striking the Earth now. And that asteroid, which has the potential to transform every industry, every company, every individual's life, is artificial intelligence. Sundar Pichai from Google called AI more important than electricity or fire. For me, the way I see AI is there are going to be two kinds of companies at the end of this decade. Those that are fully utilizing AI and those that are out of business. It's going to be that stark. On the flip side, it has the potential to uplift every man, woman, and child on this planet. It is the ultimate demonetizing and democratizing force, force for food, water, energy, health care, education, everything. And we have an amazing panel here to discuss it. Let me take a moment to do quick introductions and then tee off a few uh, points. So first off, on my left here, Her Excellency Paula uh, Ingabiri, uh, the Minister of ICT and Innovation and Government of Rwanda, coordinated the creation of Smart Africa, has led the development impl uh, implementation of national ICT programs. Um, thank you for your work and welcome, Your Excellency. Uh, next, uh, Michael uh, Kratios, the Managing Director of Scale AI, the former CTO of the United States, the former Under Secretary of Defense. Um, Michael, a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. So we have two government leads, you also play a corporate lead, and then my friend Imad Mustak, the CEO and Chairman Founder of Stability AI. Um, stability, if you don't know it, and hopefully all of you do, has generated some 15.15 billion images, um, 150 million users, 300,000 developers, one of the leading AI and the only real open source AI program. So uh, let me begin with this question. I'm going to point it to you, Imad. Uh, how long do we have to get our world ready for this, for AI? What's a timeline for AI? Thank you, Peter, and thank you <coughs> everyone for having me here. I think we've seen this year, Microsoft, Google, the biggest companies in the world adopting it like that, $100 billion off the Google market cap, and then increases from the other side. The AI has got so good so fast that I think it's here now, and next year is the year of enterprise adoption, and the year after is the year of global adoption across all media types. And would you say, you know, we talk about AI alignment and that we, you know, one of the, one of the concepts is AI is becoming so powerful so rapidly that as it reaches what we might call artificial general intelligence and then super digital intelligence or digital super intelligence, we have a short period of time to make sure AI is uh, aligned with human needs. What is that time frame in your mind? Um, I think it's very difficult to tell. It'll never be shorter than 12 months. But I think the key thing is amplified human intelligence. What are human needs? And using this technology to address those. Even if we stop today, in four or five years, we can have an AI tutor for every child. We can organize the global climate healthcare knowledge. We can make movies just by describing them. And I think that's a crazy thing. Before you get onto these unknown unknowns almost of this AGI that everyone talks about. What's the real human impact today? So I want to march down here. Michael, uh, what do governments need to be thinking right now and doing, and are they? Yeah, so for a lot of the, for the United States and, and Europe, we've seen a lot of progress in the last six years in, in AI regs. So this isn't necessarily a new thing for the regulation of AI. What's new is the creation of these large language models and how the governments can actually cope with them. And I think the most important thing when I think about AI regulations is the still deep scientific and technological question of testing and evaluation. If you want to create any type of regulatory regime, 
whether you want to be able to approve AI-powered medical diagnostics at the FDA, or whether or not you want to approve autonomous vehicles at the Department of Transportation. In each of those scenarios, you need a robust testing and evaluation regime so that regulators can understand where the problems are and how ultimately, and if these technologies are actually safe. So back to sort of technologists and basic R&D, we need to build that capacity to do testing and evaluation. And most importantly, in the large language model world, that testing capacity does not exist yet. That's something Scale is working on, and many scientists around the world are working on. But when I think about, you know, when I think about AI and computation and, and data, I think of exponentials. When I think of governments, I think of sublinear, um, with all due respect. I mean, can, the, can governments really regulate something that is moving this fast? Or do you think it's going on? Maybe it's going on in Rwanda because of your leadership. In, in the U.S., do you see it in other parts of the world? Well, in the U.S., uh, where I am based, you certainly see a lot of excitement here. There's no senator that doesn't want to get in front of the camera to talk about artificial intelligence today. Um, the reality is that um, as I think about the U.S. regulatory ecosystem for the last 200 years, What's been terrific about the U.S. is we've created a very successful sector-specific approach to regulation. If you're regulating, you know, the first cars that were regulated didn't even have sort of electricity as part of them. And as they progressed, the regulatory infrastructure caught up with that new technology. And I have faith that we can do so with AI, but it all comes down again to the testing and evaluation regime. We have to empower these regulators to understand how to do the actual testing and evaluation to be able to prove very demonstrably to the American people and to the world that the technology is being deployed are safe. I'm going to tip over on this chair here. Uh, uh, Your Excellency, uh, Rwanda, AI, uh, I didn't expect those two words to come together. Uh, how has this become a priority for you? Can you speak to that, please? What's your, and what's your vision? Uh, thank you very much. So let me start with the fact that for Rwanda, um, when you look at what our future drivers for growth are, uh, technology is one of them. And so what that also means is that we need to be looking at what are the trends in the technology space globally and also locally and how do we build the right capabilities around um, enabling that growth driver to take the country to the next level. And so that's why a lot of our focus has been on understanding what are some of these emerging technologies that are going to change and shape the world. But Um, and, and AI guidelines. And you do ask a very good question, how do you regulate what you don't know, especially in a field that is fast changing? And what we've seen historically is that when it comes to technology, many times governments are playing catch up with the level of innovation that is happening uh, globally. Uh, but just to come back to a few points that were raised, it just requires building the capacity to be agile enough to learn and pivot as you understand new risks, as you understand new opportunities, as opposed to creating a regulation that is pretty much but that is, built But that stone. is the speed that humans operate at, not technology. And do you think we can be agile enough to iterate rapidly in this? I don't think we can. I think we must. We, uh, we uh, must. Agreed. Um, because the absence of that, all the risks that we think about, first of all with AI, the biggest risk that we're going to see, whether it's in the near term or long term, is the diminishing trust when it comes to AI and any other emerging technologies, but also the combination of these uh, technologies that are going to shape the world. So, and governments have such an opportunity to build that trust by putting in place the enabling blocks, which is the regulations, the standards, the guidelines, the ability to test and evaluate, the ability to audit how you deploy some of these uh, solutions. And so, it's not a question of whether we can, it's a question of how fast should we be doing this to ensure that we are also providing the right environment for such to happen. Do you get pushback at all from, um, from members of government uh, about AI, or is it open, free policy making for you? None of those. What we get is concerns, like any other Concern. place, concerns of how are we going to deploy ethically uh, these AI solutions, there's everything that we're seeing happening and how is Rwanda or as a government, how are we putting in place the necessary, necessary mitigation measures to ensure that some of these risks that we hear about or see do not manifest eventually. And that also stems, earlier when our president was talking, it also stems from knowing that we have come up with very many homegrown solutions, some things that have seemed impossible. Uh, for many countries and we've been able to pilot them and so there's already that social contract and trust that is built with our people to understand that 
when we choose an area or something to build as a government that is going to take Rwanda to the next level, it's there, but we need to also be looking at the risks and concerns that come with it. And so it's less of pushback, but rather trying to understand how much we are doing to ensure that the risks do not create unintended consequences that are far-reaching than the benefits. Thank you. Imad, you have a probably what I consider the most beautiful vision of the positive side of AI and how, um, you know, I've asked you who will benefit from AI, the north or the south, the east or the west. Can you, can you speak to, uh, to that? The best, <clears throat> the best way I've thought about encapsulating what this is, these models are like very talented graduates that occasionally try too hard. So we shouldn't trust them for facts and other things, but again, they can expand and scale ourselves. What does this mean? You look at the global south, you've had a brain drain almost constantly towards the west. You look at the west as a knowledge-based economy. What does that look like when everyone can have the best tutor in their pocket and you have GPT-4 level intelligence on your mobile phone? How, how far is GPT level intelligence in a two gigabyte file on your phone? How far is that away? Um, at most two years away. So we've got to GPT-3 level intelligence already on a smartphone without internet. And I think within two years, we'll get to GPT-4. So I, I, it's a really important point, right? So you, you can have it on your device, in your pocket, able to provide you medical advice, advice on legal advice, advice anyone with one of these devices, which is effectively free, yes? Yeah, and then that means that intelligence goes across the world and capability, and this has been the key gap, the expertise gap, as the previous kind of panel kind of said, and that's hugely impactful. MedPalm 2, Google's model, last year got 63% accuracy on medical. Now it's 87% overtook human doctors in just a few hundred gigabytes. That will be smaller. But it also scored higher than doctors on empathy. Yeah, I, this is uh, amazing. It was just a recent study. It was in JAMA, Journal... Uh, uh, I forget what JAMA stands for. Uh, but it's, yeah, it scored much higher than human physicians on empathy. Because everything's been reduced to numbers as opposed to, again, human connection, and that's why we should look to amplify. What does that mean? It means the global south can leap forward just as they leapt to mobile. And that's where the growth of the world comes, because they have the intelligence, they have the capability, they didn't have the opportunity. Because, again, you saw this brain drain go that way, but now the expertise comes there. Against that, the West and developed economies will have to challenge with knowledge-based societies. What happens when there's a deflationary wave from education, healthcare, and other things being augmented and optimized by this technology. 93% of US inflation and CPI is education and healthcare. Everyone will have their own personal doctor. Everyone will have their own personal teacher. And I think that's a big change in the world, but it's one that, again, will allow for equalization, democratization, and huge growth because people will have the barriers removed from them achieving their potential. and. I think there's billions of people in the world that can create even more amazing things than we've seen today. So one of the things I've said is whoever wins the AI arms race, and it is an arms race, we see the arms race going on between companies primarily right now, there may well be in, in, in governments and defense systems, but whoever wins that arms race this decade wins it for the century. It is, so how do you make sure that this isn't a US or Chinese only capability that it becomes accessible. And then the whole issue around uh, bias. Um, Michael, and, and I open it up to all of you here. Yeah, I think the first thing, this first wave of LLMs, it's only been going on for actually less than a year it's now. It's crazy, right? It's, it was November of 23 last year. It's, exactly, yeah. So the, the major models have essentially been trained on the totality of English language information available on the internet. And if you think about, you know, what percentage of total human knowledge does that encapture or that, that, that consist of, it's, it doesn't really include, to the extent that it should, sort of information from and relating to the Global South, for example. So I think the next wave of models that you'll be seeing developed are fine-tuned versions of these large language models that exist today, which are infused with the data and information from countries around the world that don't necessarily have the correct amount of representation in what's just available on the internet. So who owns those models? So there's going to be, I believe, a, a two-part two world. In one part, you'll have the large, uh, pre predominantly American uh, LLM developers by these large, sort of large tech companies, and then you're going to have a very vibrant open source community. 
And um, I think there is a, a world where both can coexist, and they can be both be useful for different use cases. Um, I think what you're seeing with GPT-4 is it's really good, but it's also really expensive. And there's lots of use cases where an open source model could be just as good, if not better, for what you want to accomplish. And my sense is that this very vibrant open source community is going to open up a lot of opportunities for um, nations in Africa and in South America and many other places of the world to start fine-tuning those models to the specifics of that country, whether it's a particular dialect, whether it's culture, whether it's tradition. And in doing so, you'll be able to have a model that actually serves the people of that country uh, in a way that it rightfully should. And maybe, Please. just building off that, when, just coming back to your questions around the arms um, race, it's, gr it's good um, to be the first to do things, but I think it's great if you're doing things that create impact uh, in terms of how many people, how many lives are you improving? And so for a country like Rwanda, one, what is very important in talking about large language models, how do we have large language models that are built in the local language? Because in terms of impact and how many people benefit from that, you require that to be done. And that's why when you look at our national uh, policy on AI, a big percentage of it is focused on building the right talent and skills. Uh, because those are people who are going to be creators of those AI-enabled innovations that then create the much-needed impact that is required. The other thing uh, that we need to also be looking at, uh, again, this is back to impact and, and the, 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 the session. to take away most jobs, and what are you doing about it? Is it going to displace a lot of jobs? And so it becomes a question of, can we think about augmentation of tasks versus automation? How does that feed into the curriculum and how does it feed into the reskilling and upskilling programs? Because you want to make sure that AI and human capabilities can uh, coexist. Can I ask a question? How many people here, if you have kids, do you feel like your schools are preparing your children for the future that's coming in the next five years? You raise your hand if you think you're getting a good, I want to know where your kids go to school. Um, <laughs> I think that's one of the biggest challenges is we are still educating our kids on decades past versus a very different world they're, they're going to see. Um, Imad, what do you, how are you training your large language, your models for Rwanda or for you know, any parts of the world? So we do open source, and I think, again, open source is like your own graduates, and then OpenAI and everyone else is like getting a consultant in, and you do need both of them, especially in this transition period. So today we released the best Japanese language model and we're spinning up teams in countries across the world and supercomputers because this is infrastructure. It's vital national infrastructure. Uh, I, want to, I want to repeat that again. This is vital national infrastructure for every country. These large, this, this AI capacity trained up in, for a nation's culture and language. By the people of that nation, you need by the expertise. The yeah. So it's by the people, for the people, because ultimately, this is the future of your government. This is the future of your education system, of your healthcare system. It has to reflect the local. It can't be a closed model for that. Closed models are for other things. And you need to know what's inside there, if it's educating your kids, if it's your medical system, if it's inside your government. And 5G is multi-trillion dollars. This is clearly more important than 5G. So it again, it's clearly more important than 5G. 5G. This is 5G for knowledge. And our entire systems run on knowledge, and so the pickup on this will be insane across the world. And again, that's why we have to innovate with integrity. We have to set good standards. Mm -hmm. And I think my view is that open is the best way to do that because we can challenge it. But again, there'll be in a massive role for private other models mm -hmm. where you need the real expertise in that. Michael? I couldn't agree more. I think these are going to be extraordinarily valuable national or sovereign assets because what they do is they present and they, they actually are a foundational element to turbocharge all facets of the economy. So you start with a foundation model, which can essentially is a multi-purpose model that, being, that is pretty good at a lot of things. The next step is getting it really good at specific things. And you have to have, if you have a base model that's in the right language, with the right culture, with the right traditions, then on top of that, you can build a fine-tuned health model. You can build a fine-tuned tourism model. You can build uh, a fine-tuned sort of economics model. And for each of those, your own industries within your country are able to tap into that and leverage that to build them. So once it's there, it's sort of an accelerant for every use case going forward. I think that if I can just step in there, a couple of panels ago they were discussing regenerative tourism and the rich history of Saudi from Daria, kind of going all the way back. That should be encoded in your education models so everyone can understand that. 
we need to actually have this context encoded and that builds stronger societies. Let's talk about alignment of AI with humanity. How do you think about that, Your Excellency? Is, uh, are we able to build AI models that are aligned with humans, humanity's future? Uh, do you trust the AI models being developed right now? I don't trust the AI models be, being built right now, but I also believe it's possible uh, to build AI models uh, that are really aligned with human values. And this is where uh, the question of being intentional in how we design and deploy and develop some of these AI models and what they are coming in to do. Without that level of awareness and intentionality, it's very easy um, to really uh, build the kind of models that we see today that are actually fueling this, the risks and fear that you continue to yeah, see globally. I so agree. You know, uh, Imad, um, on alignment, uh, how do we, right now, AI is learning from all of the trash and all of the brilliance in the internet. How do we train those models? Where do we get the data to train those models? Yeah, so right now the models are on huge amounts of data, 10 trillion words for GPT-4 or 100,000 gigabytes for our stable diffusion model, and it comes out as a two gigabyte or 100 gigabyte file. Trained on the entirety and then scale AI trains it back to being human aligned as it were. Just like our kids, we've got to feed them better. We need to have national data sets, open data sets, aligned data sets, and a vision of the future because we don't know what we're aligning against. We don't know where this technology will take us. Let's really factualize. This is what we'll do for education, healthcare, and others, and align against that goal. Just like if you're traveling in a stormy sea, you need to know where you're going, mm -hmm. and then that will change it. Michael, think... risk versus benefits. If you overregulate, you kill the benefits. If you underregulate, you know you got too many risks. How do you do this? Yeah, I think you generally have to take a, a risk-based approach to, to regulation. And uh, it's, it's a great buzzword to say, it has to be risk-based, but you have to find a way to actually operationalize that. For more serious use cases, back to the medical diagnostics, if you're going to be making life-changing decisions about someone's health, that needs to go through a more rigorous evaluatory regime than, than, let's say, a movie recommendation algorithm. But just to go back on what you were saying, I just to close the loop there on the alignment question, the way that you train these large language models are, it's two steps. It's one, you take the totality of information out there you can scrape from the internet and cram it into a model. Step two is where you do a process called reinforcement learning with human feedback, or RLHF. In that process, you actually have expert humans generating data, which is then fed back into the model to improve its performance in certain domains and areas. And only with this two-part sort of scenario where you're actually able to bring in human expertise, knowledge, and understanding into the training itself can you achieve the alignment that you're ultimately looking for. Ladies and gentlemen, please get ready for an incredible two or three years ahead and a decade that's going to look nothing like the decade we've had in the past. Give it up for these incredible leaders. Thank you all so much.